Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Sanders. I'm the head of accreditation for the CICMQ program from the from the Chartered Institute of Credit Management. We have a great audience today. We have 54 people on from all sorts of different organisations uh, across the UK, and it's lovely to see everybody. Great to see some new faces as well as some of the some of the old clients as well. Um, today, I'm very very pleased that we have um, a Deco talking to us. We've got a very very cool new branding, by the way, uh, which uh, which I made a mistake. I put the wrong brand on. On, on, on LinkedIn and as a result I got told off you know the brand police are out there um, so um, so I've got I've got the new I've got the new branding <coughs> over us. Um, and um, and uh, Deco um, have been CICMQ accredited since um, May I think it is 2013 um, so they were not exactly early adopters but they weren't long they weren't they weren't that uh, they weren't that far behind um, and, and also they are a center of excellence um, and there are only I think five centers of excellence I can see there's a couple more of them on here at the moment and um, there's only five centers of excellence um, in, in the UK so uh, and also of course they've won pretty much every award going um, so you can you can argue that um, they're probably um, they're probably um, I would say one of the best credit management organizations in, in the UK if you disagree with me then you need to do CICMQ and find out um, anyway, um, so I would very much like to, I'm going to share my screen now so that uh, you can see the deck here. If everybody, once again, could uh, could stay on mute and leave your questions until the end, that would be great. Um, if uh, you can see that presentation, please give me a thumbs up. Then that's great. Okay, that's good stuff. And I would like to have very great just pleasure to hand over to Lizzie Doppelhofer and Debbie Matthews from ADECO. Off you go. Good morning all. Good morning. Um, first of all, thank you, Chris, for the lovely introduction. A um, little bit embarrassing, but thank you. Everything you said is, of course, true. And uh, really nice to meet you all. Obviously, some of you already know. Big shout out to my former boss, Martin. Hi, Martin. Nice to see you today. And yes, yeah, so we are the Echo Group. Chris wanted to leave this slide in for our branding. So yes, here it is, our new-ish branding. And then if you want to go into the next slide, Chris, just um, if anybody if anybody needs to remember, that's what an airport lounge looks like. Just, just, <laughs> just so that you know. We'll see it again in the summer, hopefully. <laughs> Fingers it's crossed. Cool. I do like that. Okay, I'll I'll leave it to you. Thank you. And then yeah, just very quickly to introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. My name is Elizabeth, or commonly known as Lizzie Doppelhofer. I am the head of credit and support services for the ADECO Group UK and Ireland. I've been with the group now for about 14 years, um, just in, in January actually, so quite a long time. Uh, my main remit of course is the collections um, AR for the whole of the ADECO UK and Ireland. And I've recently also taken on the management of support services, which in a nutshell, what they do is they're very involved in the client setup piece on the one hand, um, they're quite involved in the PO management, timesheet management, um, and also at the end, um, part of it, the dispute, so that fits quite well, because if the team that sets the client up to start with is responsible for the disputes, they can go right back to the beginning and look at the root cause as to why we didn't get the billing right first time. So um, for this year, the focus is quite a lot around getting that particular piece um, tidied up. And I'll pass over to Debbie. Thank you very much, Lise. Um, I'd like to also say thank you for obviously giving us this opportunity. It is great to get onto these platforms and get together and share the best practice. Um, so for those who don't know me, who didn't see me um, last year on the CICM stage, my name is Debbie Matthews. I am one of the credit managers at Deco Group. I manage two of Lizzie's teams for her, um, the general staffing team, which deals with high volume and low value clients, and also the professional staffing team. I've been with Deco for nearly seven years. Um, but I have actually been within credit for over 20, so really part of my passion. Um, also very close to my heart and what I also manage fully say is the CICM. I actually partner with them to get through all our collectors if they want to, to get that qualification for the CICM, which provides them with the recognition and the knowledge to obviously be even better in the role that they do. So thank you very much. Next slide, Chris, and back to you, Lise. Thank you, Debbie. So when Chris approached us um, to do one of the CICM 11 sessions, um, he did say the topic was up to us and we could kind of pick and choose what we wanted to do. So I thought in the climate that we're all working in still and have been working in all throughout last year, I thought it would be quite apt to talk about 
credit control during a pandemic and specifically what we did, um, the successes we had, some of the ch challenges that we came across. And um, of course, the session isn't to teach anyone how to do credit control. I'm sure that you're all more than qualified and know exactly what you're doing and are just as successful. But we thought it'd be quite nice to do a bit of sharing. And we hope that at the end of the session um, that some of you guys can share some of your experiences and we all can take a little bit away from that session and see if we can implement it in our own businesses going forward. So we've structured the session. Uh, Debbie will start you off with going through communication, obviously hugely important, um, particularly in our company where in our team, we've actually worked from home since uh, March last year. We have not been back to the office at all. It was quite nice seeing the lady from Northern Ireland saying she's working in an office. How novel, because we haven't done that for a very, very long time. Um, then Debbie will also talk a little bit about IT infrastructure. I do think IT get a bit of a bashing and actually for us, it is time to say thank you for what they've enabled us to do. So Debbie will touch on that very briefly. Um, between Debbie and myself, we'll then talk a little bit about, about our collection strategy and of course the results that we have achieved by implementing that strategy. And finally, I wanted to say a few words around um, the te team support development and training that we've still managed to do um, despite, like I say, all working from home and working in a pandemic. So uh, no further ado, I pass over to, Greta, uh, to Debbie for the first two sessions, starting with communication. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so communication, I think you'll all agree, is key. It is, for me, it is so important that your team are kept up to date and the information isn't diluted or distorted. Um, and also another thing that I also believe in and my manager's team is that it's two ways. Even if you're given a comms out that has to be implemented no matter what and you have no choice, explain the reasoning behind it. If someone understands why they're doing something, you're more likely, I find, to get a bit of a better buy-in. So next slide then, Chris. So I think communication, um, literally, how do we communicate with our teams and how do we do it? Anyone who's had dealings with a deco um, will be aware of our daily huddles. For those who you are not, it's just basically a morning meeting. But those daily huddles are the backbone of our communication. They've been um, implemented in a deco for years. Like I said, I've been with the company for seven years and we're very, very well established then. And we evolve them all the time. We don't keep them static and boring. We just are constantly evolving them. How do they work? So the team have their meeting at 9.30, which the manager of that team then works with all the credit controllers. That is then rolled up to the credit management huddle at 10 o'clock. Um, what I'm really, really proud to say is we actually had these huddles up and running within two days when we was all working from down from lockdown. So we didn't lose that communication and we used it via a PowerPoint presentation rather than the big boards that we had in the offices. So how do these boards work? It's not really rocket science. It is just a very, very basic structure. So they start off with successes. What have the team done well the previous day? What have they highlighted? And have they got anybody there that they will shout out then, which will become part of our stars for that week, which will also then be put on that board. We then go into performance. Now, we, I imagine everyone's the same within credit. We discuss performance every single day. Um, we go through that performance. We find out where the team have got the challenges, what their shortfalls are. Do they need support? Do they need an escalation to go through? And then from that, then an action plan is put in place. So that individual can then go and put that action plan in place to come back to the next morning at the meeting to say what was successful, what wasn't, and what was the result. But then in line with that, after that, we actually do go on to capacity. It's okay sending an individual away to say, right, this is the action plan, what we need, and we need it back for tomorrow. If they really haven't got that capacity that day, they're back to back in meetings or they've got a number of things that they're doing. So we will then look at that capacity. Have we got another individual in the team that can support or is it all will go then wider onto the credit control floor to see if anybody else can support. And if that's not the case, then we will look at that workload and we will restructure it. So we will look with that individual to say, right, this is what we can wait until tomorrow, but this needs to be done today. So then ultimately that person can come back and be successful in the action plan they put together. Um, and following that then really, we look at mood. 
this is a temperature check to see how our team are doing. Um, if someone sits there and says, I'm sad or unhappy, you know, they are then asked that question why. And sometimes it might be, we've all been in lockdown, we've all had our good days, I'm sure, and we all have our bad days. And that's okay. It's nothing about work. It's nothing about home. It's just, I'm not feeling it today. And that is absolutely fine. But if they're not, and there is something underlying, it's where we've then got the opportunity to put something in place to help that individual. If that individual then on the hood all turns around and goes, no, no, I'm fine. But you get that little bit of an inkling to think, I'm not really too sure about that. So we then do give them a call after to say, look, this is just, you know, a quick call just to make sure that you are okay. Um, and then what we do, and we have made it mandatory, is we all go on camera um, in our huddles, because I think it's very, very easy if somebody turns around and says they're okay, if you can't see them, it's really, really hard to judge, where body language tells a thousand stories. If someone says they're fine, but you can see by their body language, they're not. So then it, that is a case, then we will go back after to them to say, look, are you okay? So in a nutshell, we go over that every day. So everybody has got that plan, what they need to do for the day and to make sure they're okay. And they can obviously cope with it and cope with the action plan for that day. Um, from that then, that very nicely then goes into, we have a weekly floor meeting. This is then for the entire of the credit control department. This is actually ran by Lizzie. And I'm really, really, another thing proud to say that literally in the first Monday after lockdown, we had our first floor meeting. Now, this consists of business updates, changes, anything that's gone on throughout that week where the message needs to be delivered to the entire team. And a lot of these we do at the floor meeting for the entire team, going back to my original statement is, so the, the communication is consistent and everybody gets that same message it's not how someone else interprets it the floor is then open to say if they've got any questions if they're unsure about something so it is open then so everyone can ask questions if they feel a bit uncomfortable we tell them that they've got the option to speak to either their line manager or either their credit manager or ultimately they can then go back to Lise to get a bit more reassurance of the message that's just been delivered the floor meeting for us is very much a celebration of success so what we will do, all the team members will go through, they will give the highlights and the shout outs for that team. We then collate the stars, as I said, in the daily huddles. So the stars go from the teams and then they have a shout out on the floor to say, this individual or this team have gone above and beyond and these are the results have achieved. Um, in addition to that, on a monthly basis, we have our early debt lever. This is the individual per team who has reduced the debt the most. They then get rewarded with an hour off so they can leave early for one day of their choosing. And then ultimately then we have employee of the month, which is run across the entire of um, support services, which they then get a duvet day. Now, this is where the stars come into place because I think it's quite difficult sometimes to get to the end of the month and think, well, who did well this month? Who could we nominate? We've already got the stars there. You've got somebody who's been on that board three times. We put them through, we've got that info that they really deserve a shout out for that for that month and like I say if they are successful and win they get a duvet day and at the end of our quiz which I know Sharon even joined it as well at the end of the meeting we have our quiz which is great fun it's a bit of a chance to get together I'm the weak link of our team most definitely but it is really good we bank whoever wins gets an allocated minute and um, that's then collated right at the, at the year and then at the end of the year then they get that time off we also then, the two finalists, battle it off at the end of the year, and then they are crowned um, quiz team of the year, which is really great. Um, so that's our bulk of our meetings, how we work together and we communicate between our teams. But then ultimately, we are part of the Shared Service Centre. So monthly, we have a Shared Service Centre update, which is run by all the head of departments. And that just provides us news on any projects, any projects rather, what are in place, which ones are coming forward and why. And also from our weekly and daily huddles, who have done well and highlighted it to also give them a shout out. We then go into our quarterly town hall, which is run by our CEO. This is a very financial led call, but it, I think it gives everybody the chance to turn around. How are we doing as an organisation? Where do we fit into that organisation? And ultimately, what is the future for ADECO? All of that goes into the quarterly town hall. 
Um, but also there are times when you need to call a meeting, which is not part of these meetings. And um, I think we've all been in the situation where Boris has said at five o'clock he's making an announcement, we sit there and he delays it to late and you're like, what are you doing that for? But, you know, these messages are really, really important and they do affect individuals. I personally have been affected when they close the schools with childcare. It's really, really tough. But what happens is when the Prime Minister does make an announcement, the team know that the next morning, the senior management team, they will go through, they will have a meeting. What things can they put in place? Will, and it's, will certain individuals need support? We then, once they've had that meeting, it's delivered then to the team to say, look, this is the announcement. Does anybody need any support? Is it about changing their hours slightly? Would they, you know, look at, would they want to go on to furlough? And we've got those options available. And if we can, 100%, we do support our team to make it easier and take a bit of that burden off them. In addition to that, what was really important during COVID and when we was in the height of the pandemic in the first lockdown, Lizzie was actually our representative in the daily COVID calls with a senior leadership team which was really good for us and gave us a bit of comfort because if we obviously was anxious about something or we needed an update on something, she was our representative. And in the same, Lizzie also came back to us, whatever was discussed on that call, if it impacted any of us, we were told. And again, we were told firsthand. So the message was not diluted. And I think all of that put together, our day, our teams go into our weekly, go into our monthly, which then go into our a deco overall, and then literally our bit. So ultimately, I think we've got a real, real robust communication platform. Um, and that then very nicely goes in to the next slide. Communication is great. Next slide, Chris. But then obviously we need a good IT infrastructure. And I know, and I've also been there, literally you say, IT, it's not working again. What's wrong with it? But to be honest with you, we would have really, really struggled during this pandemic if IT hadn't put the infrastructure in that they did. Next slide, please, Chris. They were very, very prepared. They'd already put in a continuity plan, which was pre the pandemic, was if our office burnt down, how would everybody work the next day? So a lot of this was pre-prepared with them. They actually rolled out laptops to every colleague which was all, had all the latest security on there, the, com the communication platforms with MS Teams and Skype, so everybody could work from home and know that the data was safe because of the security systems, and also we could contact each other. Um, and literally, we actually got told on the 15th of March that we had a suspected COVID case um, in credit, on that Sunday, all of credit was called within half an hour. And on the Monday morning at nine o'clock, everybody was set up and functioning and working from home. Now, without everything that IT had prepared us for, that would have never, ever happened. We actually were still able to contact our clients, um, contact each other. It was just a meeting was pulled together where we could all discuss what we were going to do for the day. And like I said, within two days, our huddles were also back on top. And ultimately, that wouldn't have even happened without our IT. Um, I think what we did, of the only thing we did struggle with a bit was where the communication externally, we obviously it was mainly via email, which we all know email is a bit more difficult than and not as effective as picking the phone up and speaking to a client. So but that was the only, but we still got through it. And now IT have actually put in a soft phone solution. So not only have we got, we've got every communication going that we can contact all our customers, internal and external, literally email, we've got everything available. Um, and in addition to that, obviously it's very different because what else we had in place was everybody worked from home two days per month. And this was prior to the pandemic. So we knew that people were secure and safe to work from home. However, I think it's a bit different working from home for two days than it is permanently. It is quite tough and sitting on your laptop, literally, you know, seven day, seven hours a day, five days a week is a lot different than doing it for two days. So obviously there was a health and safety element of it. So we went through, spoke to our collectors about the health and safety. Everyone had the opportunity then to go into the office, collect their office chairs, their monitor, their keyboard, their mouse. So they had then the option to have a desktop solution for them. But 
in addition to that, so that was fine for all our colleagues and we could contact everybody, but what about our clients? So ultimately what we did do is we con all our documentation was updated with all the relevant contact details and literally everything was changed to e-coms. Now, this was another thing that we'd also put in place prior. You used to have little mini competitions within credit control on how many people could get on e-billing. From this then, we had a big high proportion of our clients that were on e-billing. And the ones that weren't, when the collectors got through and spoke to them, it was a case, please can have your email address so we can make sure that all your invoices get to you efficiently and effectively on time. And then also the post divert was to make sure if we did have post, we could go through and collect it and obviously manage it through. And I think putting the communication and the IT infrastructure worked very, very well together. And that leads nicely into Lizzie, who's now going to talk a bit about our collection strategy. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, I have been keeping an eye on the questions people have been sending in. So Chris, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder here, but I would just like to pick up one of them because we're not really coming back to that topic. Some of the other questions might be answered later on. Um, so the question was from Atul around there being a fine line between not keeping in touch with the teams and obviously meeting fatigue. And I think that's a really, really good point. Um, one of the things we haven't mentioned is that these are not lengthy meetings. They are very structured, as Debbie said, is the daily huddle, and they are limited to 15 minutes. So obviously, if there is a day when there's more to discuss, of course, it's fine to run over the time. But as a, as a guideline, there should be no more than 15 minutes so that we don't get that meeting fatigue. And it's 15 minutes in the morning on a temperature check. And like um, Debbie said already, to make sure people have the support that they need and that they can go and get their targets for the day. Um, and the floor meeting is the same. It's actually also 15 minutes. And it's a good good that you asked that because of, of late, where things have actually become a little bit more BAU and, and we're all a bit a, a lot more used to working the way we are, we have actually moved the weekly floor meeting to fortnightly and said, we'll put it in weekly if there is a comes to share, but actually if there isn't, the standard is now fortnightly. And it's exactly to avoid what you mentioned at all so that we don't get that meeting fatigue. Um, the town hall and the um, monthly one, they're limited to an hour. And we tend to have a bit of downtime after um, all have a drink together on Zoom or Teams or, you know, some of us go for a walk. So it's kind of like it's not just the meeting. Um, it, we also do it at the end of the day. So that's kind of rounding off your day rather than breaking up your day when you might be busy and kind of going, I haven't got time for this meeting. I'd rather be doing something else. So it is something that we're very aware of. And thanks for asking that question. A really good question. I thought. Okay, so then moving on to the collection strategy, I'm sure it's something that you've hopefully all been waiting for to see uh, what we did in the pandemic and kind of how we got through it. Next slide, please, Chris. <laughs> Sorry, I have to see um, Atul's response on here. So on this slide, um, initially, I wasn't actually going to mention our um, ADECO group values. But when I looked at our collection strategy, what we changed and how we did it and how we worked together with our front office, our clients, our internal teams, I did think that actually our group values of passion, entrepreneurship, responsibility, team spirit, and customer centricity absolutely came into their own. And it was a really nice realization that we lived and breathed these values without actually trying. It was something that I realized in hindsight, and that's why I thought it was worth sharing. So, and I'm sure that you've all felt the same. A huge change that we had was actually a mindset change. Before, as a collector, you pick up the phone and speak to your client. Um, obviously, as you'd expect, we have a fairly robust credit checking process in place. So pre-pandemic, pre the vast majority of our client base, we never really had to overly question the ability of our clients to pay their invoices. Willingness, yeah, questionable at times. You know, there is some clients who will wait until they get the third reminder letter or the fifth phone call from you before they pay or maybe you haven't ticked all the boxes, not done all of your admin right for the invoice to flow through their system. Um, but that was for us the biggest change that all of a sudden we really had the question for every single client that we deal with, are they actually able to pay us? And I think that was something certainly for our collectors where they did have to go through, through quite a big change because it is a very different conversation that you have with a client that actually genuinely isn't able to pay you. So. One of the very first things we did as soon as the pandemic hit is we segmented our clients 
by particularly focusing on the industries that were worst affected. So um, obviously following the news, the media, everything you hear, and of course our clients talking to us. We knew that sectors like aviation, hospitality, retail, obviously were severely affected straight away because they just have to shut their businesses down to the, to the most part. So um, we segmented those clients out and assigned them to our more experienced collectors and proactively contacted these clients to look at their current exposure, what their plan is for go forward, what their plan is to clear the debt, and then liaise with front office finance to put some plans in place. So these ranged from different things to uh, some of our aviation clients asked for payment breaks altogether and to pay us later in the year. Uh, we had some where the payment terms were slightly expended, extended for a period of time. We had clients where we um, agreed short-term payment plans so all different things, but the message here is really it's about proactively contacting these clients and making sure that they understand as much as they are trying to run a business and have to pay their staff, so do we. And, and I think it's just getting that understanding that whether you are a large client or a small client, you know, ultimately bills need to be paid for all businesses to survive. And it's just stressing that message that non-payment or sticking your head in the sand isn't going to make this go away. We need to talk to each other, communicate, and come to a solution together. And of course, you know, our approach, certainly for me in credit, because this was a situation none of us had been through before, is to absolutely, first things first, is offer the support, which is why I said we've been linking in with, with front office, finance, making sure whatever we agree is a win-win for both parties. And obviously the win for us, of course, would be ultimately being paid. And the win for the client is to be given that extra bit of breathing space that they needed initially. Of course, we knew there were government initiatives as well. So people were getting grants or loans or, you know, deferred rate payments, etc. Um, so we did give bits of advice on that, obviously quite cautiously, but just pointing them in the direction of uh, where they can go to find out if help is, is, is available to them. Um, and like I say, just always making sure that we are being supportive, but the message still has to be that Ultimately, we do need to agree a payment so the cash for the, our cash flow is protected as well. And it, it was an interesting time for us as a management team because once we got in sort of April, May time, we were looking at, well, what do we do with our targets? Because we do know that collections are much more difficult. And um, it, it, it was, it was this deciding between, do we keep the targets as challenging and aggressive as, as they usually are? Or do we soften them? What is the right message to send? And, and, and we all agreed between us that actually, where we know a client is going to be paying less because we have agreed it, of course you're going to reduce the target. That's to me is common sense. But actually where that isn't in place, we left the targets in place as they were because it did also send a message to the team that during difficult times, things don't become easier, they become more difficult and we all have to adapt to that. And that's why there's a big piece at the end of this presentation around the support that we also offer to our team. And um, luckily I'm sitting here now and I can say that that approach worked for us uh, with the results we achieved, which again, we'll, we'll show you a, a little bit later on. And then one of the things that I'm, I'm really proud of that we achieved as well, because sometimes credit control in a, in a, in a particularly a large organization can be a bit of an add-on or can sometimes be forgotten about, but where our larger clients contacted their account manager in front office, to ask for a payment break or to ask for some leniency. They didn't just say, yeah, yeah, that's fine to protect future business. They contacted us in credit control, they contacted finance. We all had a call together with the client and agreed the best way forward. They didn't just run off as sometimes we hear the stories and agreed something that really wasn't feasible for us. And I think that collaboration was a massive piece as to um, why we ended up doing our collections quite so well during the pandemic. Uh, one particular piece of work, and this was really uh, so something that Debbie owned for me, so she'll, she'll, she'll talk you through in a moment, is this COVID impact client tracker that we had, because Debbie manages our, or certainly one team that she has, manages our sort of SME cl clients, as she said already before, um, high volume, but lower value, and um, certainly being since they are smaller clients, depending on the industry sector they're in, um, so certainly more affected by the pandemic as well. So. Um, Debbie, I'll pass over to you just to give a bit of an overview of what we did this <coughs> and how we connected. Thank, Thank you very much, Lizzie. So, um, what did we do and what was it? 
So firstly, um, to get the tracker set up, we sent a directive out to, it was mainly one of my teams, as Lizzie said, that was impacted um, with the payment. So but it did also go across the entirety of the credit control. So it was a case we went to the collectors and said, if a client, you chase a client for payment and they come back to you and say, I cannot pay you because of the pandemic. You need to attach this onto a ledger. Um, the reason we looked into it and why was it managed by the credit managers and not the collectors was for two reasons. Ultimately, we've gone through and we've had a bit more experience to deal with these difficult conversations. But also, in addition as well, the collectors still had other people to chase and we didn't want them to get bogged down with a real big group of clients that were not paying and going straight over. And then the escalations then take longer to get to their managers and their teams because once a client says, no, I'm not paying, they don't escalate it immediately. They still try other ways and means to try and collect this payment. And also, in addition to that, it gave us a one-stop shop for exposure. If you've got 10 collectors that have got clients all over the place that are not paying, you can't get that exposure at a drop of a hat. So therefore, it was on one ledger. The exposure was very clear at any point in time. If Lizzie asked me, what's the exposure on the ledger? I could then go back and say, this is what it was. So and what did I do and how did we manage it? It wasn't really rocket science, to be honest with you. Um, it was just a case of calling the clients, making sure that all my facts and everything was there. Um, I had the previous conversation on record, what they said to the, um, the collector, why they wouldn't pay. And then it was a case of going into them and saying, as Lizzie always mentioned, there was a lot of schemes that the government put in, like, like loans and furlough, had they gone through and looked into that. But also it was working with the client. You know, we wanted to keep them as a client, but ultimately we needed to get paid. We was also in this pandemic and we also needed to pay our workers and our employees. And then it was a case of going through and saying, a payment plan or it was a deferred payment and say look do you know what we've got absolutely no, nothing coming in for six weeks but after six weeks we can go and do it or extend the payment terms i worked very very closely for an office to the point i'd have weekly calls and go through all of their clients with them because they're the eyes and ears for us where they'll go through they've got different contacts you know, sometimes speaking, trying to escalate through AP can sometimes be a bit challenging. If you've got someone who's got a real strong relationship with a salesperson that can pass you over to a credit person, because ultimately it was a bit good cop, bad cop, but we wanted the same goal. We just wanted to keep our clients and ultimately be paid. Um, and then we went through and some of them we got was longer. I mean, in my head, I always thought I'd like everything cleared within three months, but hindsight and what you want is great you don't always get what you want um but one size doesn't fit all you know it's pointless saying to a client right well i don't care you owe me ten thousand pounds and i want it paid over three months and they physically can't afford it it's just a lot of wasted energy chasing them up to get it to it the relationship breaks down and then are they going to come back to you after this pandemic um and a few examples we had an aviation client who owed us sixty thousand pounds um, at the end of March, it was cleared by the end of July. Yes, it took us a lot longer to get our money, but we got paid. And hopefully when we can all go on holiday again and the aviation um, sector picks up, hopefully they will come back and think, you know what, they really worked with us and we got through it. And then we had one, I had a small hospitality, they only owed us a thousand pounds, but they were really, really struggling and they didn't know when they were going to open and what was going to happen. You know, they could only afford £200 a month, so it took five months to clear. Not ideal, but ultimately the result was exactly the same. But what really, really, the positives that came out of it was it was a good training exercise for the team to go through. Difficult conversations are difficult for anybody to go through and do. But, you know, going through them, how did we deal with these difficult conversations? What did, we have, what did we say back to them? How did we bring them around? And it's just that negotiation piece. I'm working with a client to think, because a lot of companies don't want their business to fold, ultimately. They have got the end goal to continue to trade, which ultimately to do that, they need to pay us. And at one point we had um, over 150 accounts on this ledger and the project was really, really successful. And literally we ended up sending 11 
that went to further action. So overall, it was really, really good, but it was the collaboration of SSC and front office and all credit control working together. But no, I personally think it was really, really successful, which then goes very nicely into the next project that Lizzie was part of, the Debt Destroyers. Thank you, Debbie. Um, yeah, as Debbie just said, a, a really big part in all of this is just collaboration. And we keep mentioning that word, but it, it is absolutely a, a, a key word for us and that, that, that we do. Um, so we did have a debt destroyers project. And I, I, I felt the need to put this on here because it was actually something that was created and driven by front office, which I think is something very unusual. And of course, our sales departments were hit by this pandemic, of course, without saying, and we're normally there focus would be on selling that that just wasn't possible for a period of time or certainly reduced for a period of time so some of our in one of our brands took the initiative to create this debt destroyers project and what they did was they assigned senior uh, personnel from their team and tasked them with reducing their 90 plus disputes so we had weekly league tables obviously using the competition that sales are used to uh, weekly league tables of by branch, how much they had reduced, and we refreshed the data every month. So it wasn't just the starting figure um, that they were working on, but anything that was rolling in as well. And they started at 2.2 million of 90 plus disputes. And as at the end of the year, that figure was just 200K. And that's something I'm extremely proud of. And again, big shout out to collaboration because it was operations that started that project. We supported them, of course, um, but they took the lead in it. And it's it's been so positive that other brands want to jump on it now and do the same this year. And actually that particular brand who had this great success is carrying it on in a slightly um, modified way, of course, because sales are coming back and they are back to their BAU, um, but we're still keeping the spirit of that project in place. And our 90 plus will never be that value again because we've all got the tools and skills to know that we shouldn't make that happen. Um, Chris, onto the next slide then, because it's great that we're telling you all these things that we've done, but um, what do they actually mean in numbers terms? I know that's what you all want to know and because that's what we're all me measured on. So Debbie, what did our strategy do to our overdues, please? So these are the figures comparing December 19 to December 20. So our overdues at the end of December um, 19 was 28 million. We reduced this by December 20 by 10 million pound, taking it down to 18 million. So in December 19, the percentage of our ledger overdue was 16%. We actually got this down to 9% in December 20, which is over a 40% reduction in our overdues. One thing I'd like to point out, we all know it's really difficult in credit in December to try and get payments through. It is always I think within credit, even when my previous role, December was always a difficult month. And um, we actually got our overdues down to 10 million pounds in um, October, which was literally 7% of our ledger. And I just think in one of the hardest years ever to get our lowest overdue on record, it's something I am really, really proud of. What did our 90 plus look like? Well, at the end of um, December 19, it was 4 million. By the end of December 20, we got it down to 2.5 million. Um, and I'd just like to know in there, there was actually one client for one and a half million pound that has got a complex legal matter going on. So at two and a half million, only a million credit control can influence. What did this do to our write-offs? We've reduced our write-offs 50% year on year. Um, and disputes were literally eight and a half million at the end of December 19. And we actually reduced this down to 4.4 million at the end of December 20. So I think in the year we had, those figures were something we are really, really proud of. But Lizzie, what did that do to our DSO? Okay, so our DSO in December 19 was just over 40 days. And as at the end of December just gone, we are on 38.9. Um, that, that, that's our average year to date. And again, just a metric that we're hugely proud of. Now it is a 1.4 day reduction, which equates to around about 7 million pounds. and as you all know, any extra money in the bank, especially with the year before just had, is something that we need. Um, obviously, the higher, the better, and for us to have done 7 million. I'm extremely proud of the team for achieving that. And it might not sound like a lot to reduce your DSO by 1.4 days, but um, our DSO used to be much, much higher a number of years ago. And actually, our biggest achievement is to having got our DSO to 40, now having, having actually broken that 40 mark and gone below that, and continuing to still reduce despite actually our 
bigger new client wins all coming in on extended payment terms. So um, it is something that as a team, we, we are, like I say, extremely proud of. And you might notice that the financials for me are all fantastic and great, but there is one KPI that I think is probably, not probably, I think it is the, the reason for the rest of the results. And I've put it in gold on here for a reason, and that's our employee net promoter score. Now, our employee net promoter score was at the end of December, which is the highest it has ever been. Um, we get the net promoter score out of regular service that we run. Um, Wait, Lissy, um, we, um, you went quiet on the moment you mentioned the actual number. Oh, sorry. The net uh, promoter score, yeah? Yes, the EMPS is 53 for us as at the end of December. Right. Um, based on a survey that we do once a quarter. And I'm going to be very honest, at one point, our EMPS was actually negative because there were just things that the team didn't like um, and just a certain um, policies that we had in place that they weren't entirely bought into or didn't understand the reasoning behind it. And we have, have achieved the highest engagement score to date in credit control, which was 8.6 out of 10. And our company benchmark is 7.8. So again, for us, just just outstanding, you know, for an organization where I genuinely believe that the people are at its heart of it. I know we couldn't achieve these results if our people were, were, weren't happy and all contributing to everything that we do. And when we looked at these scores, actually some of the things that, that we scored really highly on was to work in a, an environment. So this working from home and the support people got really, really stood out. And another really important one was to score the company cares about every individual's well-being. We scored 9.8 on that question, which is for me again just outstanding. People have the equipment to carry out their job. It's all of those when we looked at them and had really, really high scores that we were just really pleased. And that's why I do make a point of not finishing my presentation on the financials, because of course they are important, but you can't achieve these if you don't have the people behind you and you don't support your people. So Chris, if you want to go on to the next slide, and I just want to finish the presentation with spending a couple of minutes talking about the support, development, and well-being that we were able to pro provide to our employees. So a final slide, please, Chris. So I've just put a few pictures in here because um, I thought I'll just talk you through a little bit. So for me, one of the things that was really, really important, just because we're all working from home, just because we, 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 we all have different challenges to face doesn't mean that as a company, we, need to, we should stop training and developing our people. You just have to adapt how you do that. And I'm, I'm really, really proud of our HR department and grateful for their support because they put different sessions on for us. So we had um, sessions on conflict management, on how to have difficult conversations. There was a lot around health and safety training. You know, we're all working from home now. What is really important? How do you still achieve a work-life balance? And then for our managers, how do you manage performance remotely? And for all colleagues, how do you navigate a changed workplace? If you had all of these sessions, they were on multiple times in a week and everybody could just join on Zoom. You didn't have to register for them. You booked them in your diary. You're on for half an hour or an hour, depending on, on obviously how, what the content of the session is. But anybody was able to attend, to attend these. And actually for our managers, we made some of them mandatory. And that was simply because they wouldn't otherwise make the time in their diary to attend, attend these. And we did get really good feedback as well, saying that they did help them. And then aside from the training, and Charles, I'm really glad that you put that in the chat because it's a cliche and I'm glad you said it first, but the whole it's okay not to be okay has never been more important. So I've had, um, I've, I've been obviously, as all of us, been on so many different conference calls. And you know, you see people getting flustered when their, ch their child or their dog or their cat appear on camera, and it's fine. If anything, it breaks up what's usually a, possibly a boring meeting anyway. And, but I think the worst thing you can possibly do is that parent already feels bad because that child has turned up. And um, I just think that's, that's wrong, you know, and to entertain the child for a minute, say hello, wave at them. Or if the parent has to go away and just support that child for a minute because they're homeschooling and doing so many different things, don't make them feel worse about it. I, I just, I just, I just personally, I'm really feeling quite passionately about that because it's just so, so important that we support our managers, our employees, and everybody's going through such a tough time with, with all of this. And surely as an organization, 
so a meeting gets interrupted for five minutes. It, it really doesn't matter. And yeah, um, maybe Charles needs to keep his clothes up. <laughs> that would be supportive if that was to happen. And then and other things we did, I, I mentioned HR before. Um, one of the things that they did for us, they sent us throughout the pandemic on a weekly basis, we got emails with tics, um, tips and tricks on how to work from home, different links to go to how to look after your mental health. And it's again, some people don't need that. They don't like that. They are of the man up generation and that's fine. But those that need it, it's being sent to them. They have a link to click on and they can do that in, in their own time. Um, HR also did sessions on, on um, things like preventing burnout, managing anxiety and developing growth mindset. Just all of these things that are more about you as a person rather than you achieving your targets. And I think that just has to be that balance between the two. And, and in, in the office, right? We don't all work eight hours straight. We go to the water cooler, have a chat. We go to the kitchen, we go to the toilet. And you talk to people, that's normal. N none of us now have that anymore. So some of the things that we've put in place is like a coffee break, where for half an hour a week, the team gets together and just chats. We don't talk about work, we all have a drink, not alcoholic, obviously, it's during the day, but we all have a coffee, tea, whatever you want to have, and just talk to each other. And some people don't like it. That's fine. They don't have to join. But for those people that do like that kind of stuff, the fact that they can do that in their work, that it does mean an awful lot. We do things like walk and talk. So when you have a one-to-one, -one, get out and uh -huh. just walk with, with, with whoever you, you, yeah. you do that with. And I know myself and Wendy, who happens to be on the call today, in the first lockdown, we went for a lunchtime walk every single day and just chatted rubbish at each other for an hour. But it was really, really good for both our mental health because you don't get to see people. And if you're anything like me and you are a social person, that is something that you really miss and you need to find a way to replace that and replace it safely. And still charity, I've put shelter on here because I mean, that charity has probably never been more important, right? We're all complaining about being in lockdown in our lovely houses, hopefully. Um, some people don't, don't have that. So, you know, the fact that we were supporting shelter last year is something I'm really, really proud of. And we did cook-offs and bake-offs. And one of the things we did for Win for Youth and Shelter, which, which I loved, was around the world in 80 days. And basically we had 80 days to clock up a certain amount of kilometers between all of us. And we always had a week to get to a, the, the new destination. I think the final walk home was Dubai to Birmingham, not the best end destination, but we had to come home at some point and we raised money while, while doing it and we got ourselves out, we got ourselves a little bit fitter or, you know, just, just trying to keep healthy as well. And I think as any organization, it is our responsibility to put things in place where people feel comfortable with what they're doing and making sure as much as we can that they are okay and recognizing that if they're not, that they need a bit of support and not disciplinary or anything like, like that. So I think that balance for me has definitely massively shifted with everything that's happened last year. So that's why I did also want to end my presentation on that point today. So uh, moving on then to any questions that we have, Chris, I don't know whether you want to go through them. Uh, yes, uh, we do have quite a few. Um, let me uh, just quickly run through. Uh, we'll start at the we'll start at the be at the beginning, way back at the beginning. Yeah? Um, how do you make the huddles uh, effective in lockdown, please? This one's from. Right. Yeah, so I think one of the things is cameras must be on. Um, you, you you might get an individual that really doesn't want to, and that's okay. Luckily, we ha we have a great team. I can't stress it enough. All of our guys are on camera. But also tell them it's okay if they're turning up in their pajamas and a bone on their head. Chris was telling me when I locked down today that I scrub up quite well, apparently, because yesterday <laughs> when we spoke, like I do today, you know, and that is okay. I am not going to get up every morning and put makeup on to sit at my laptop all day. It's not what people do. I'm quite surprised how many actually do it. I, I don't. They made an effort for today. But I think we need to just stress that message to everybody. We know what you all look like. We've worked with you for years in the office. You haven't changed just because you're now working from home. And I think obviously there is this element about house embarrassment. I, I think that that's a new word, um, but you can put a screen on. It doesn't matter, you know, and nobody will mention it and people use a phone screen. And I think you make it effective by having a structure and by sticking to a time and sticking to, um, so I can say we, we start with, right, success and challenges for yesterday. What's the performance looking like? Are you gonna hit your target? Yes or no, if not, what are you struggling with? What can I support you with? What can we do to help? 
and then going into your problems and updating from what we talked about yesterday or the day before, whatever has hit the deadline for us to talk about it again. And then really important, how are you all feeling? Have a great day. And that's it. And then they can contact you again. But if somebody sort of has a client problem that's a bit more involved, take it offline. Try and stick to your 15 minutes. And I think that's how you make them effective. Okay. Okay. Um, are the team looking forward to returning to the office or are some happier and feel more productive working from home? That's from uh, Fran from ABB. Yeah. So our ENPS, as I briefly mentioned before, has absolutely shown that our guys love working from home. Um, they do miss the social element of work as mm. in seeing each other occasionally having a chat and, you know, just, yeah, just, just seeing people in person rather than just on, on, on camera. So we are certainly looking at how, how we do things going forward. Um, we've actually, during the pandemic, also changed buildings. So as it stands, our particular office, we're currently homeless. Um, so we are, I think, I think we're, we're looking at Q2 um, to have our new offices, but we are looking at how we can um, ele um, incorporate an element of working from home much more regularly going forward. Okay, so um, so for Karen and, and Lisa from Tarmac, um, they're going to be moving in near you, apparently. So uh, so, so be afraid. Happy <laughs> neighbours, share best practice. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> okay, so um, how about this one? Um, how do I translate this into a small team, please? Could we have clarification on what this refers to huddles or strategy or which at what part was that? Com uh, was that question? Uh, that's from that's from Kay. Are you on, Kay? You still on? If you're on mute, say hello. Yeah, I'm here. I'm uh, here. Okay, yeah. So, uh, what? What? Do you, how many people have you got in your team? <laughs> just, just four. As of yesterday. So you got okay. four. And what's your question? Four. four. Okay, four. Yeah. four. Yeah. Well, how do you translate what you're doing four, yes. into a small team? Yeah. So, in terms of our huddles, they are done by individual team. So we actually have one team of just four people and we still have to huddle the same way because actually most of our teams are no larger than seven people in any one team because the huddles also roll up. So you have the individual team huddlers and then we have a management huddle that I'm part of. Um, but you can do that huddle with, with, with two people if you wanted to because it's all about just having a structure in place. And actually when there is less people, you can also be more effective because they all get a little bit more time to speak about the, the specific challenges and issues. And you might even be able to drop that down to ten minutes if you've only got four, four people to do it. In, to do yeah, it. Had that. Michael, Michael from uh, from Atreides asked the question um, uh, with Brexit, etc. Are you finding it particularly difficult on DSO? But I think you answered that question with uh, with 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 the improvement that you've seen in DSO. Yeah. So um, I think the Brexit will probably hit later this year if it does affect us. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you find so this is from um from, from cherry um do you find that uh, customers are paying on the whole without the need for payment arrangements um certainly now yes absolutely our client impact tracker is gone it's a thing of the past we had it in place last year until september i think and then we phased paced it out again because there wasn't the need for that um so during the pandemic some yes some no depending on their own individual impact um, now, definitely, we are back to much more of a BAU environment, yeah. Right, okay. Um, let's go to... Um, uh, how do you... How, this is a good one. How do you determine which debtors are playing the COVID card or are they truly financially struggling? Do you want me to have a go at that one, Lisa? Yeah, sure, go for it. Go. The, the thing, going through it, because I obviously manage the tracker, I think it's going back and looking at your history as well. If you've got a client who says... I cannot pay you, but they say Amazon, that's a bit of a going way off. We know that that client is up and running and it's really, really strong. Are they impacted by COVID? No. And I think it's about going back to them and telling them what you know to go through. If we've got temporary workers that are still in there, so the business is still running, all of those are the indicators that the business is still turning over. And yeah. I think it's going through your history, looking at the client, what um, sector are they in and where they are, looking at the credit which I know can change daily but once you start having those conversations and I think it's a bit of a bluffing game where they'll come and go can't pay you because of Covid, can't pay you because of Covid and I think once you get into those conversations using front office what we know what that organisation is doing because of the rise in ears yeah. and 
like and I think from that then you actually do go through and we have um, yeah and that, that's a good point we did um, understanding the customer is getting more and more important and one of the things that we've done <laughs> um, is that um, we put together a thing called a can't pay won't pay um, yeah like a quadrant I think I've sent it around to a number of people if anybody wants it send an, send an email to CICMQ at CICM.com and it's a can't pay won't pay quadrant basically it gives a series of strategies about 10 or so strategies that you can use to determine and if you've got a customer that won't pay or can't pay it helps you to determine which is which and it yeah. also helps you to make sure that um, you know you're putting out you're getting rid of all of the obstructions you know that oh it's can query oh this or oh, that okay so um, if you want that um just just let us know um what else we got here okay i'm conscious of time uh, time is now 1201 so what i'll do is i will finish i will finish the, the the recording now um and and then we'll carry on answering questions afterwards if that's okay for everybody um so thank you very much indeed lissy thank you very much indeed debbie uh, this will be uh, it has been recorded it will be put onto um the cicmq's uh, CICM um, uh, YouTube channel um, and it'll be it'll be dated with with a deco on it as well so you'll be able to catch up with it on there as well as the 19 other sessions that we've recorded including tarmac from a couple of weeks ago um, so I'm just going to stop recording now so thank you very much indeed and we will we'll carry on after this <laughs>